Hi, YouTube family. It's Daughter of the Most High. I have something on my heart that it's actually been on my heart for a while, and I decided to share it tonight, and it has to do with Christian marriage. So um, I'm going to get right into it. Uh, I want to start out by saying that marriage is a sacred covenant. It is a unique bond designed by God. Genesis 2.24 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Isn't that amazing? One flesh. So this unique bond, the family, is attended, intended to bless husband, wife, and kids, but also extended family, the community, the church, the family is a blessing. The family unit is a blessing, or it should be. That's why the enemy has come against it so hard, is because it truly, when done right and done well, it is a blessing. So, um, the marriage covenant is not a contract. It is a covenant, and a covenant is a binding agreement. Now, if you know about covenants in God's word, that they are ironclad, that they are written in stone. And that's the way he designed the marriage covenant. Um, covenants cannot be broken. Some marriages are a beautiful example of God's design. Husband and wife love each other. They love their children. They pray together. They keep Christ at the center of their marriage. The both husband and wife know that they are accountable to God for their role in the family and their relationship to one another and to their kids. When we are accountable to God for who we are in our relationships, it helps us to stay on the narrow path. It helps us to keep our behavior in check. We always want to keep God at the center of our relationships. These couples support one another. They provide comfort and an assurance to one another. They hold each other accountable as mature partners in marriage do. They may hurt one another from time to time, but never on purpose, never intentionally. They discuss, discuss issues and problems, and they apologize to one another when they've hurt or offended the other. They truly have the best interest of the family in their heart and in their mind at all times. They think about their decisions. How will this dis decision affect my wife? How will this decision affect my husband or my kids? They're taking their family into consideration because they value their family. If you do not have a good and loving marriage and a healthy family, like growing up or currently, when you see a healthy or loving couple or family, it will stand out to you. That's just how it is. And this is true for all of us. It's true for me. When I see a healthy and loving, loving couple or a healthy and loving family, it always touches my heart and it makes me wish I had that too. It's so special and wonderful. Many couples fall short of God's design for marriage. Perhaps one or both of the spouses, maybe they're selfish or lazy or quick-tempered or any other negative trait that a person may have. They may lack the ability to communicate. They may not be good at problem solving. But the difference is, is these couples work together. They know that they have issues and they work together to try to at least come to a, an agreement or resolve the issue. These couples may have a bumpy journey together, but the difference is, is they are committed to one another. They try to work through things. They are open to counseling or books or video teachings or whatever they can access to learn and grow and make some healthy changes. So, even though their marriage might be bumpy, it might be difficult at times, they're working together to work through things. And I think that's the majority of Christian couples fall in that category. 
there are also marriages that are very unhealthy. One or both of the spouses are abusive. Perhaps it was due to childhood abuse. Perhaps it's maybe they just have a strong temperament. Whatever the reason, they are abusive to one another. It may be verbal abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and or sexual abuse. Instead of working through issue, issues, instead of problem solving, these couples are fighting, they're blaming, they're toxic in their communication, they're hurtful to one another, they may be hurtful to their children, or the children just get hurt in the crossfire. They may be slamming doors, they may be throwing things, they may be making threats, or they may be silent, um, giving the, the other spouse silent treatment for days. And usually if, because the middle ground, you know that the middle ground is always the healthy place. And if you're on this extreme or this extreme, this extreme is all the overt, you know, door slamming, yelling, and then the other extreme is the silent treatment. Both are unhealthy. And if you can hear my doggies, they always seem to be doing something while I'm making a video. Um, but the other extreme is the silent treatment. Neither are healthy. Neither, neither end is healthy. You want to be in the middle. You want to be appropriate and assertive and trying to be loving and kind and while you're problem solving your situations. But again, we're back to the toxic couples. The household is full of fear, full of tension, and even in between the storms, hang on, I got somebody right here. I work all day, so my doggies sometimes will come right here. So my bed's right here, and they'll just sit right here on the edge wanting my attention. And uh, I was sitting on with them on the couch while I was putting this message together. So we had a lot of sit-together time. But, you know, when mama works, you know how that goes. So let's get back to... Uh, the toxic couple, the household is full of tension and, and, and full of fear. And even in between the storms, you know, you know, if you have one of those households that you're, uh, fearful in between the storms, cause you never know when the next one's going to erupt. And that's how I, uh, that's how it was for me as a kid. I mean, you just live, even though you might have even, you know, a semi-peaceful week, no issues. You always are tense because you never know when the next blowout is um, or the next round of chaos. And people always say when a marriage is toxic, maybe ending in divorce, um, that it, it takes two to tango. Have you heard that? It takes two to tango. Well, I heard that when I was heading towards divorce. I just have another puppy here. I got two doggies. Um that it takes two to tango, and I can tell you it, it takes one. It takes two to tango, but it takes one to kill a marriage. And sometimes couples both participate in this dysfunction, and sometimes only one of them. I didn't participate in the dysfunction. I know what it means to have a healthy marriage, and I know what it takes to get there. But if you don't have a willing partner, somebody that's willing to work with you, there's only so much you can do. Now, it helps to not participate in the dysfunction. It helps a lot, but it never changed like in my covenant spouse situation. I've been divorced 12 and a half years. I couldn't do it anymore. And he was unwilling and still to this day is unwilling to ever make, you know, work on any changes. And now I just mean regarding our children. Um, so uh, I'm going to move on to my next point. In the past two and a half years, the Lord has awakened me to um, the covenant, you know, the covenant portion of marriage, that that a marriage is a covenant and it's, it's binding. And there's a verse that talks about um, 1 Corinthians 7, uh, 39 says, a wife is bound to her husband as long as, she, as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. So a wife is bound to a husband as long as he lives, which means the husband is bound to the wife as well, till death. So 
during the past two and a half years, I have learned about the marriage covenant. And I have learned, first of all, that it is binding. And second of all, that our churches don't teach God's truth in this area, which is incredibly sad since adulterous remarriages and the couple in hell. If, if they don't repent and get divorced, they will end up in hell. So, but that that is not my point. I just want to make that point at this at uh, this point in the in uh, the video. Um, the majority of the people that actually do know about the marriage covenant and may be standing for the marriage covenant, and this is on Facebook and also on YouTube teachings. The majority of the people that call themselves standers. Um, you know, waiting for their covenant spouse to return home. This group of people, and, you know, it's wonderful that they're actually doing this and standing for it, but there's um, a disturbing trend in this group that this that's the reason why I'm making this video is because there's something that I don't agree with in this community of people, and that's what I want to share on this video. I want to share a balanced view of Christian marriage in this video. So, um, I have never heard in everything I've listened to in the past couple years, I have never heard about a balanced view on the Christian marriage. Um, first of all, I have heard many channels and many people blame all the issues in the family on the divorce. So if the kids have any issues, if Either spouse has any issues, they blame everything on the divorce. Every issue points to the divorce. And we have to understand that there are many, many unhealthy um, days, situations, occurrences, um, interactions all along the way that led to, led to this divorce. A divorce doesn't fall out of the sky or drop like an axe handle on something. There are you know, those incidents and situations all along the way that lead up to the divorce. It doesn't come out of nowhere. So, and so many people talk like this. And so when there's dysfunction in the family or if there's any kind of issue, they blame everything on the divorce. And the fact is, is that, first of all, there was dysfunctional behavior all along the way that led to this point. And... I think I am like concerned when people make sweeping generalizations about divorce and that if their, you know, if their spouse or their kids have any issues at all, it's all blamed on the divorce. So let's say, for example, somebody's kid is struggling in school, or let's say their kid has self-esteem issues or um, mental health issues or something like that. They're going to blame it on the divorce. If, you know, my kid's getting bullied at school, it's blamed on the divorce. If, you know, I'm struggling with anxiety now, everything is the divorce. The fact is, is that everything doesn't point to the divorce. It's all the behavior that has been dysfunctional that led up to the divorce that is part of the equation. And the other part of the equation is sometimes people just have issues. Do you are you aware that sometimes our kids have mental health problems, even if we have a healthy and intact marriage? Sometimes our kids have self-esteem issues. Sometimes they fail in school. Sometimes they have other issues. And we have, say you have a loving and good family, you still have things that you go through as a family. So yet in divorced families, everything that happens gets pointed to the divorce. And it's not true. It's not the case. Again, it's a sweeping generalization that every problem we have is due to divorce, and that's not the case. So I want to make that point for sure, is because I see that so often that every problem just lands in the divorce bin. It's because we're divorced, and it's, it's not the case. Now, are there things certainly that can be attributed specifically to that breaking of the family, the divorce, yes. But everything, no. 
Not by any stretch. No. Um, I wanted to share another example, too, that is a problem in Christian marriages. And this is the flip side of that same issue. So when we blame everything on divorce, then the flip side of that belief system is that we must stay in the marriage no matter what. There are two sides of one coin. We must stay in the marriage no matter what. And the fact is, is that if you have a dysfunctional spouse, if you have an, an abusive spouse, and this person's behavior, husband or wife, is tearing up the family, you need to take a look at that. And you know that many churches, it seems to be, again, the extreme, They'll either tell you, you know, you can divorce, you can remarry, all this kind of stuff. No, that's not the case. Or they think you have to stay indefinitely. You're married, you stay no matter what. Even if the situation is dangerous, not even just destructive and dysfunctional, but dangerous, they will tell you to stay. And it's so ridiculous. It's so inaccurate and so not what God has for us. So if your spouse is abusive and unwilling to change, you need to separate from that spouse. And sometimes that separation alone will encourage that spouse, will light a fire under him or her to actually look at their behavior and be willing to make a change. Sometimes people just don't change without experiencing some pretty serious consequences. Perhaps your spouse does have a problem, be does have problem behavior, but is willing to work on change, Sometimes you need to separate anyway because you have been, you and your kids have been exposed to this for so long and it's so dysfunctional. And so by separating, you're taking a breather and gathering yourself and working and counseling, reading books, you know, watching videos, talking to people, all that kind of stuff to try to rejoin, to come back together again, to have a healthy marriage. So you can separate just to have a sanity break. The thing is, is that when people say, you know, you stay no matter what, you know, no matter what, no matter what, I've heard that so many times, just keep forgiving. Even the unrepentant spouse, you just keep forgiving and walking in forgive, fit forgiveness, even though your spouse is unrepentant. That's another area that's so incorrect. It is not correct. That's not even healthy. If your, if your spouse has problem behavior and somebody counsels you or advises you to just stay and forgive and stay and forgive a bajillion times, 70 times 7, that is not the proper application for that. The marriage situation is not the proper application. If that person repents and says, you know, I'm really sorry I struggle in this area, but I'm working on it, you can forgive them and work with it. But if they're unrepentant and you just keep, um, you know, forgiving them endlessly, it is not even healthy for them. And I'm not saying be in unforgiveness. I'm saying separate out and get away from this behavior. So hopefully those marriages can be saved. Because if you have somebody that's at least willing to work on it, you have more than a lot more. You have something to work with. Some people are married to people that are so unhealthy and they are so completely close to change. I mean, even believers, that's what I'm talking about. This whole video is about Christians, not about unbelievers. This is about Christians and there are Christians that are so unhealthy in their behavior and completely unwilling to change. I know of marriages where spouses were so narcissistic and that narcissism and that just selfish way actually progresses to such a level of dysfunction where the relationship becomes dangerous. It's because they are so entitled. They have such a, you know, they aren't entitled. They think they're entitled to have everything be their way. Everything's got to be about me. And they become dangerous when they don't get what they want out of people. So, Narcissists actually are not relational. They're not. They 
just have people in their life that suit a need for them, fulfill a need for them, and when that need is no longer being fulfilled, they turn on them. That's narcissism, and it's dangerous. And sometimes Christians can marry a narcissist because they put on a good show in the beginning, and then their true colors come out later sometime down the road, sometimes not very far down the road. I've known of marriages where substance abuse is an issue. And now if that person is actually working on recovery and making changes and making amends, that's one thing. But if you're in a Christian marriage and that person is not working on um, recovery at all, you need to get yourself and your kids out of that situation. It is so unhealthy to be around substance abuse and the behavior of the, the abuser. And when they're hung over or jonesing for, you know, withdrawing, jonesing, all that kind of stuff. They are in such an unhealthy mindset. They're, they're not even good to be around. So perhaps by leaving, you can encourage them and light a fire under them to maybe, hey, go have an assessment and get into treatment. Start working on this stuff. You're tearing this family up. But if that person is unwilling to change, do you have to sit in that till you die because of the covenant? No. You can separate out. The Bible says you can separate, but you have to know you cannot remarry. You are in covenant with that person. Okay? There are also marriages where there's chronic cheating. And that is so unhealthy and even dangerous sometimes to continue to be in relationship with that person. So sometimes in those situations, you need to separate out. Sometimes that person is unable to work and um, because in their free time when you're gone at work they're in, either in indulging in substances they're cheating they're online dating they're flirting they've got all this kind of stuff going on you don't have to stay in that you can separate out now when I when I separated from my covenant spouse he filed for divorce so I am divorced but he's never been willing to work on anything. So that's just my situation. And some people thought that I had to stay in that endlessly. And I was miserable. I was miserable in that it wasn't a marriage. It was a mess. You know, we were legally married, but we didn't have a marriage at all. It was a mistake. I made a mistake. Now I am in covenant with him, so I cannot remarry. But I also don't have to live in that. So please understand that I'm not advocating for divorce. What I'm saying is there are certain situations that are so toxic and so unhealthy and so dangerous. Now, some people will say, oh, if he, you know, he or she's physically abusive, then you can leave. If that person is so toxic verbally, that matters too. It is not just the drawing the line of physical danger. No, that is incorrect too. If Toxic people are so difficult to be around. Just even their energy flow is so unhealthy. And the way they talk, you don't have to stay in that. Please know that you can separate out. And, and, but you must stay single. Okay? So I just wanted to clarify these points because there are people in the church that will actually, you know, advise you to and actually shame you for leaving and it's just not, it's not fair and it's not correct. The truth is sometimes we have to get out because God wants us healthy and well. So that's all.